I'm going to do a couple of minutes introducing David. Um, first of all, I want to say um, for those of you who um, need more biography on David or on David's work, I've done something very analog, and um, this is where you need to go. Lorian.org, L-O-R-I-A-N, Lorian. Dot org, okay? We'll show it at the end as well, and it will be in the um, email. All right, so um, if you've been reading my emails, you will know that David is my favorite spiritual teacher. And um, this is not because of the quality of his articulation or the quality of his intellect, both of which are great but because he has a lovely, lovely vibe. He has the most loving, compassionate, warm, supportive, caring vibe of any of the spiritual teachers that I've ever worked with. And you'll know from my work at Alternatives and Fintorn, I've worked with over 500 of them, including the big names. David, you're, you're top of my list. You, you were so much top of my list, I went out of my way to make friends with you so I could hang out with you. And that was a, a joy. And um, it is a huge, lovely pleasure to have you here with us. So you may now say something. <laughs> Thank you, William. Um, and, and as I've often told people, I feel you are one of the also one of the finest spiritual teachers I've ever met. Uh, so mutual regards, mutual strokes. Well, thank you. I just wish I wish I had as loving a vibe as you. <laughs> so listen, let me let, let's get straight into it. I've, I've said to everybody, I'm not going into your biography and all the rest of it, because people can read that on the laurian.org website. So here is and I'm going to ask you questions that, I think that are of interest to me, that I hope will be really interesting for you to unpack and also be relevant to everybody who's listening in their own development and learning. Okay. So here, here's my first question. It's, it's two parts. The first bit's short, and then the, and, uh, the second part's a bit longer. The first part is, how old were you? when you first started to be aware of other beings, energies, consciousnesses. That's the first part. And the second part is, how did you discern that they were not aspects of your own psyche, but genuinely beings in their own right? And how has that journey of discernment continued through your life? Does, does that make sense? Yeah, surely. Um, so uh, I honestly do not remember a time when I was not aware in, of in some way of subtle energies or non-physical, uh, the non-physical dimension. Um, it was just there for me as a child. And and I, um, you know, it, it never occurred to me to to try to discern about it. It was just part of my environment that that came and went. It wasn't. It was not consistent. Uh, it wasn't like I was having uh, clairvoyant experiences every day. But but I would um, dip in and out of this awareness, and I I would see. Um, just other manifestations of life, is, I think, how I would put it. It wasn't always seeing a being. Sometimes it was, but uh, most of the time it was, oh, well, as if everything around me was pulsing with life. Uh, everything was alive. And I, I remember, because I was much older then, by this point, I was probably around seven, uh, but I remember going to a movie theater with my parents, and in those days, they had a 
usually showed a cartoon at the very beginning of the of the feature. And so the cartoon they were playing was one of these Disney cartoons in which all the the furniture comes to life and starts talking to the to Mickey or whoever it was. And I remember sitting there watching this and thinking, oh my gosh, um, they've made a, a, a movie about my world. <laughs> and it wasn't like the, the sofas and the chairs got up and danced around the room and talked to me, but, but there, was a, um, there was the sense of a, a reciprocity of awareness that, that there was this life in, inherent in the, the things of the world that was uh, sentient in its own way and could respond to me, not in the form of words or messages, but in a sharing of uh, yeah, love, really no other word for it, I suppose. So um, it wasn't really until I was a teenager and my, my parents uh, moved to uh, Phoenix, Arizona. We'd been living in Massachusetts. Um, I, I suppose I should back up just a little bit. Uh, my father was a uh, in in the uh, in army intelligence stationed in Morocco for six years. So I grew up in Morocco. Um, and at one point, uh, there was a UFO that flew over the base. That was uh, many people saw. It was written up in the paper and. And my mom and dad did see it. I did not. I was in, inside at the time. And mom came running in and saying, David, come out and see what this is. But by then it had flown over the base. But it, it uh, awakened in my dad uh, a very keen interest in UFOs. And so when we moved to Phoenix, uh, that was, there was a lot of UFO uh, interest and in groups studying UFOs. Mm-hmm. And we joined one at the time, and it turned out actually to be a uh, kind of a a spiritualist group uh, in which the leader of the group was a former spiritualist minister and he was channeling uh, various uh, beings. And let let me pop David, let me just pause you for a second, because there's something you said, which, which I think is key here. And I, I, it's, I just want to pause on it, which is that your first experiences of your relationship with this other world, this more subtle world, um, was that it was loving. Yes, it that, was. And, yeah, and this is huge because there's so many people have psychic experiences, clairvoyant experiences, intuitive experiences, but but what's not packed into that, which it was for you, yeah. was love. So you were having both a, a mystical experience, so to speak, and, and an occult one at the same time. Yes, that's true. And there were, I mean, there were occasions when I would run into something that was not loving and it indeed was um, hostile or certainly unfriendly. But that was, uh, for me, that was the exception, not the rule. And and just to complete what I'd said earlier, it was when I got to into this group at Phoenix, uh, that suddenly I suddenly realized that what I was experiencing wasn't usual, wasn't normal. Uh, and that's when I I started actually thinking about it in the sense of reflecting on these experiences and And then seeking to discern what was me and what wasn't. And did you have any internal guidelines? I mean, did did you at any point think you were possibly slightly mad? I mean, <laughs> what, what 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 was going on inside you? Because I think you, have, you you know you, you say quite often that you have a scientific thought process. Well. I, as I say, because I grew up with it, I just took it as as normal experience, and 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 uh, I didn't really reflect on it that much until I was in my teens. Uh, the odd thing is that um, 
I, my main interest in those days was in science, uh, still is to some extent. Uh, and, and I determined that I wanted to be a scientist working in the, in the laboratory. And so when I went off to college, that was my chosen field of study. And the irony of it was that the, the kind of uh, abstract studying that I had to do in, in math and science actually uh, awakened and sharpened my awareness of the subtle worlds. And, you know, I, um, William, it was a kind of a confusing time because I was at that time uh, with friends and the friends of my parents who were all involved in one kind of metaphysical uh, journey or another. And, and they, had strong <laughs> they had strong opinions about uh, the reality of the subtle worlds and what subtle beings were like. And, and, and I realized over time as my own awareness sharpened that uh, it was different from what they were experiencing or what they were, uh, how they saw the, the inner worlds. So I think my process of discernment wasn't so much focused on what, what of these experiences is, is coming out of my imagination or out of my psyche and what is, is real. Because I, uh, there was just an intuitive sense about that. If it, was, if it was coming out of an actual contact with a subtle phenomenon, there was a response in my body. There was something I could feel that it just felt uh, different than something that was emerging internally out of my psyche. But my areas of discernment was where, where did my path and where did my awareness of these inner worlds um, differ from what everybody else was saying and believing around me? And, and so for a period of time, I just felt like I was um, uh, solitary, like I was I was just following my own my own path, and I had to figure it out because um, I couldn't really adopt the belief systems that were uh, being offered to me at the time. Can you name the core element of the difference between your experience and how the folk around you were describing the um, metaphysical world? Well, one one way uh, was uh, was around this issue of love and the way that I experienced the inner worlds, um, because as you actually you put it very well, it was a blend of uh, mystical and occult awareness, and with and in those days uh, heavy on the mystical side, so the sense of of the beloved, the sense of oneness, the sense of the vibration of love moving through the world was that was uh, my uh, dominant experience, and and the the beings that I became aware of emerged out of that. Uh, the folks around me were much more involved with, I guess you'd say, the battle between light and dark, and and being warriors of the light and, and um, you know, like um, one, one person whom I knew, uh, he would, he had these prayers of protection from dark forces, but it would take him half an hour to run through the whole litany of protection. <laughs> um, and that just was not the world that I was inhabiting. So, and, and it wasn't that I, that I felt that they were, were wrong or mistaken, just that we were having very different experiences. And, and I, there was nothing in my experience that quite um, coincided or correlated with what, what they were experiencing. It was a lot of fear, actually. It was a lot of fear of the subtle worlds. 
yeah. in the, in the folks that I knew. So let, let me pause you and ask another, pose another inquiry, which I think would be relevant to all of us. So there you are, a, a, a youngish man, and your experience of the inner world is different from these other folk, and you assert very clearly that you experience the inner world as loving. Can, can you articulate the elements of your actual experience? How, how did you, how and where were you feeling it in your body, mind, heart, energy field? How were you experiencing love at that young age? What was going on for you? Yeah. Um, so I, I have to think back. Um, to what it was like when I was in my late teens and 20s, early 20s. Um, you know, my, my experience of these things has, has always had a, a kind of physical component, uh, which is honestly hard for me to locate. It's not like it happens in my heart or it um, uh, happens in my you know, my my throat or my head or third eye or anything like that. Where it actually seems to happen to me is in a, uh, like a, an egg-shaped field that's around my body. And and uh, I, I've always had this sense, or I've had this sense, it became clearer to me when I was in my teens, um, that the actual body I was inhabiting was larger than the physical body that, everyone saw. And so it was um, a lot of these sensations were happening in this field, but it was not l locatable in a specific place in my body. Um, yeah, I mean, remember, the model, sorry, I interrupted. No, I was just going to say what it would do at times is I would, I would find myself, um, well, <laughs> I'd find myself laughing spontaneously a lot or bursting into tears a lot. Um, and there weren't tears of, well, sometimes there were tears of sadness, but more with just a sense of being overwhelmed, uh, just feeling overwhelmed by, huh, by the world, I guess. Uh, the, um, the beauty and the, the, The amount of love that goes into this world that 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 holds this world in its beingness, and so that you know, you know that would be the usual sensation: your throat tightens up, and you know tears start falling, and that kind of thing. Yeah, but the model that I often use for this that that, that people have trouble getting often is that we are more than just our bodies mm -hmm. and what happens in our energy field ripples through and our neuroendocrinal system registers it in a kind of, in in a very personal way but what seems to have been happening for you let me, let me see if this sounds right is that your whole, for either good karma or good fortune, your whole energy field is experiencing the benevolence that rolls through the universe. And your body, nervous system, endocrine system was able to receive and feel that experience. I would say that's right. That's a good way to describe it. Yeah. Um. Because that, that, for me, is the foundation of what then leads you towards what you've called incarnational spirituality. Because, yes. let, me, let, me, let me try this out on you, because you can't get to feel the love unless you're in your whole body, because your whole body is the instrument of perception that gets to feel it. It's not a head trip. 
It's not a chakra trip. It's a whole energy body trip. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. That's, that's putting it very well, William. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeehaw. <laughs> Yeehaw. All right. So, so with that, because we're kind of we're kind of moving forward through the decades now, and I'm kind of kind of putting to the side all the Fintorn stuff and Peter and Eileen and all those stories into incarnational spirituality, which is what you named your approach. And is is it right that in actual fact your teachings in general? for your students, for your colleagues, is, is about, hey, guys, get deeply into your body and feel the love. Well, it's partly that. Um, certainly, that's, that is a, an important element. Um, and the other side, the flip side of that is saying that we don't incarnate only into a into a physical body, that we are incarnating into a, a whole field of connectedness and relationship. And so it's not it's not only into the physical body that I ask people to uh, attune, but but to but into that and from that into this whole field of connectedness that I, I call our, our incarnational system, the, just the, the, the patterns of connection and relationship that we have with our world. So, so I think the one thing that I want to get across to people that I, in my classes, is that we, we incarnate into both a physical and subtle dimension. We have both a physical and a subtle being. We're am, am kind of amphibious that way. So, um, I, so this sense of incarnating into the whole being, the whole person, includes both of those two dimensions. So that requires that we wake up, become conscious, become mindful of these two ecosystems, the ecosystem of the body and the ecosystem of our interdependence with all life on this planet and beyond? <laughs> well, I'm not so sure about how far beyond, but... Um, okay. <laughs> well, into, be into, the they, in, into the beloved. Into the beloved. the planet. <laughs> yeah, but, the, but, the, but all, all that yeah. is, the, the beloved. No, no, I, I understand, yeah, I understand, William. Um, part of my experience is that the physical body is much more where the physical body doesn't make a distinction between physical and subtle. But we make that distinction in our minds. And so, in a way, we restrict our, our physicality into a fairly narrow range of experience. And I'm, I just ask people to, to, to expand that, not to leave it, not to go you know, traipsing off beyond the body, but to recognize that the body itself is participating in this larger dimension. It's participating in a larger way, let me put it that way, than is, just the way we normally think about our bodies doing. This is a tough ask that you're, yeah, you make to your, your students, because you're asking them to do two things, multitasking. They're allowed to become fully aware of the vehicle, the temple that carries you, and simultaneously be aware of its relationship, which is your relationship with everything you've just named. That's, yeah. that's, a, that's a tough discipline for people. Yeah, it, it, it generally takes people some time to really get it and fall into that, but when they do, it's very life-changing for them. So let, let's put it into a more global perspective. Sure. And I, and I, I mentioned it in, early, in an earlier email to you that we, we'd go in this direction. I'm very interested in the fact, and this relates directly to what you've been saying, 
that over the last, well, 50 years, but in the last decade in particular, there has been an increasing focus on embodiment, uh, yoga, qigong, tai chi, uh, body body awareness, body therapies, psychoneuroimmunology, polyvagal theory, all this stuff that asks us to become aware of how we are in our bodies. And that, to me, is a kind of, um, though it hasn't got the metaphysical angle that, that you put on it, in terms of humanity in general intelligently incarnating into its vehicles. Yes. It seems to me to be a good sign. Oh, I, I totally agree with that. Uh, I have a number of friends who are deeply involved in somatic therapy of one kind or another. And yeah, the, um, the work that they're doing is, is wonderful. <clears throat> it's, um, it's transformative in many ways. And I mean, I remember one of my inner colleagues, uh, a being to whom I gave the name John, once saying that, the challenge, well, the challenge was that we um, lived too much in our imaginations, and and then and then actually the thing that got me into doing incarnational spirituality, or one of the things, um, was a being that said to me, "You know, the problem with humanity isn't that you're too incarnated; it's that you're not incarnated enough." And that got me thinking about just what that meant. And part of that certainly is the sense of how do we come back into our bodies more fully? Uh, I mean, <laughs> you know, we, we, we learn what we teach. And um, though I'm happily going along teaching these things and then uh, get walloped with uh, bladder cancer and a number of other surgical things, and, and which goes on for some years. And I realized that that this is my, my journey more deeply into my body. And, uh, and actually, I, I look upon that whole experience as, uh, as a good one because it, it, it helped me come into a deeper relationship with my own physical body. So, you know, out of theory into practice. <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 I hear how you milked it for your development, and yet I still look at deity, the great architect of the universe, and I go, bad design that we have to suffer <laughs> to wake up, you know? Oh, I, I totally agree. Yeah, it's... Uh, I, I got to tell you, William, I'm checking the fine print next time I come yeah. back and drive. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so listen... Let, let, let's try and get really mystic for a moment. So if we're part of an interdependent species, yeah. which is part of an inter interdependent metaphysical ecosystem, as well as a Gaian ecosystem, then from a grand cosmic perspective, and people may wonder why I'm articulating and shouting a bit. It's because um, David's had a hearing problem since he was six years old. So that's why I'm being so careful to speak this way so I can be understood and heard. I don't normally shout at people. <laughs> <laughs> so so there's, if we take a big mystic perspective, that I mean, I, I would say that one of the core experiences of a mystic is that there's a cosmic benevolence seeking to express love through everything. And I would agree. At, and at one level, the human soul, and we're not going to get, get into a conversation about what that is. Sure. The human soul is linked to all other souls seeking to ground love into Gaia in a new way. So incarnational spirituality embodiment, somatic therapies, dance, all the rest of it is, for me, an indication that at a 
mystic cosmic level, something good is happening at the moment. Oh, I, I totally agree with that, William. That's my experience as well. Um, um, yeah, I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure what to add to that, actually. I mean, you, you've said well, it very it, well. It, it, well, it's hugely hopeful, isn't it? I mean, I just, yes. I, just want, I, I want people to wake up to the fact that they notice that in the last decade, there has been this huge development in an awareness of embodiment, the connections between psychology, illness, body, all that kind of stuff, and mindful presence to the body. And that is a, in the middle of all the crap that's hitting the fan on our planet at the moment. I, I would like people to hold on to that as a, a note of optimism. I totally agree, William. And I, you know, I feel in, in my work, uh, it's, it's resonating to that. I feel that that's, there is this larger movement afoot to bring love and a sense, a sense of connected benevolence into the world more fully. Um, you know, uh, going back to this whole idea of, you know, the, 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 the struggle between light and dark and the forces of good and the forces of evil and all of that. But my approach to all that is always is more like that of an ecologist, um, because if, if you change an environment, then organisms have to adapt to that change or else they have to leave or they don't, uh, they die out. And I feel what's happening here is, is a, a massive change of the psychic environment in which we're we're living, but it's very subtle, and, and I mean that in the original meaning of the word, not in a metaphysical way. It's it doesn't it doesn't follow the the dramatic arc of you know Western drama of of the good versus bad and one triumphing over the other. It has nothing to do with these dualities. It's a steady. Uh, alteration of the pH of the environment, so to speak, you know, so that so that various kinds of forces and and patterns that can thrive when things are uh, you know, acidic, um, you know, in metaphor, um, no longer can do so because this this input of love is altering the overall environment at a very basic level. But it's not easy to see as an individual, not always easy to, to perceive that. You have to pay attention. And that's what you're saying, too. You have to pay attention yeah. to what's going on. It, 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 it's subtle, and it's very long-term. Very long-term. But, 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 you, a lovely being, were instrumental in, um, and I know you, you probably don't want to own it now, in um, getting the, the phrase New Age onto the billboards. Pe people, do you remember New Age? Yeah. And one of the honors that David and I share is that there was a papal encyclical published by the Vatican which accused um, David and me and a couple of others of being instrumental in a kind of demonic uh, conspiracy to overthrow uh, the true church and um, blah, 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 blah. Yes, it's all very Dan Brownish. Yeah, yeah, it was great. It was, and I phoned, I phoned the Vatican, actually. I don't know whether you know this. I phoned the Vatican, and I got through to the priest who was in charge of the diplomatic section, who was actually in charge of editing that encyclical. And I asked him, I said, I want some transparency about the evidence you're using for these accusations. And he said, no, no, we, we never share any of our information. <laughs> and I, I felt honored by the whole process, actually. Oh, um, there we go. 
There we go. But, but listen, the point, the point I'm making is this, that although the, the idea of a new age was in many ways preposterous and even banal, at the heart of it was an idea that there was a swing happening in how love incarnated deeply into humanity. Oh yeah, yes, I, I totally agree. Um, you know, I I didn't set out to become a spokesperson for the new age. I kind of blundered into it when I um, arrived at Finhorn and began working there. Uh, even though, in a way, I'd been part of a kind of a nascent new age movement in America, but the term new age wasn't that well. No. It had very different meanings. Uh, it was very apocalyptic and, and uh, yeah, <laughs> end times kind of thing. Uh, but, but when I first heard about the New Age, uh, I was, oh, golly, 14. Um, my father had had a reading from a well-known psychic at the time, and she told him that, that he was to become part of the new age. And, and when I uh, heard that, something in me said, this is very important, this is profound. There's something happening here uh, behind all the expectations and all the images that people are using to describe it that is genuine. Um, and, and, I, and I still feel that. Um, so it's, and there was a time, uh, a brief shining moment of a, two or three years <laughs> when the, when the meaning of the new age was, I, I feel about to break through into something that was not silly and not banal and not, um, well, <clears throat> sensational and apocalyptic. Um, and then it, it, it wasn't quite able to do that. So. Why not? Yeah, well, I, <laughs> for me, in my experience, it happened uh, when um, Shirley MacLaine made her TV show. <laughs> and, and totally flipped. So, and this was very dramatic actually in my life because um, I knew people who were starting to, who were going to put out books. Uh, they were books on science and on change and on, on um, cultural transformation. And the publishers were going to highlight them as new age. After that, um, TV broadcast, uh, these authors wrote their publishers and said, please do not put New Age on my title. Mm -hmm. And my favorite bookstore at the time, which was, happened to be a Barnes & Noble bookstore here in the area, uh, they had a whole New Age section. And it featured uh, not just books on spirituality, but books on science and books on uh, economics and new forms of economics and uh, uh, political change and, you know, a whole gamut of, of cultural transformation. The day, I should not really the day, but, but within the week after Shirley's uh, broadcast, <laughs> I went in and that section no longer existed. Wow. They had moved it, and now there was a New Age section, but now it only contained books on astrology and psychic phenomena. And, uh, and at the, also, there were two or three organizations that I was scheduled to speak at, and they contacted me and said, we don't want you to speak because um, we don't want anything to do with the New Age. I mean, it, it was just like this dramatic shift within a matter of, of, of a month. Um, 
following Shirley's broadcast. I'm not accusing Shirley of doing, but there was something there in that dynamic yeah. that people just flipped over to seeing the New Age as an excuse to um, pursue their own personal and private uh, yeah. quest for sensationalism. I th I've, yeah, I mean, you know that I sometimes call myself a socialist. And I, no, I, really, no. Ron, William? I, mm -hmm. No, I never guessed. That energy should flow freely, and that includes resources. Yes. Um, and I totally support courageous entrepreneurs. <laughs> but I, 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 re I remember watching, because I was running the program at St. James's Alternative, I remember watching what you're describing happening more slowly. And in my head, it was, okay, that's the, the energy field of capitalism, commercialization, just going new product. Yes. And sucking it in and regurgitating it. And I'm, I remember a joke at the time, which was, what's the difference between a pagan crystal and a new age crystal? And the answer was $300. Yeah, <laughs> you know that's right. And the, the commercialization of a, a more diverse form of esoterics and spirituality um, saddened me. Saddened <laughs> me hugely, and st still does, because I I remember those years yeah. when it genuinely felt as if we had a chance to liberate a more diverse person-centered approach to spirituality that <clears throat> sucked yeah. some of the energy out of traditional faiths and gave the power to individuals, and suddenly greed, profit, it, it was. And, um, and well, what you're I, an important part of that, William. I mean, the work you were doing at St. James, you were uh, really trying to bring the best of that forward. Yeah, I know, but we were also part and parcel of commercializing it. And now when I hear myself say all this right now, I have another part of my brain thinking, oh, William, don't be so naive. How could you have been so naive at the time? This was bound to happen. Stop complaining. Because what actually happened through the commercialization was that huge numbers of huge new gateways what this is up true. for people, new gateways to spirituality. And you, that voice in my psyche says, you're just being a snob, William. You're just being a purist. Relax, surrender, and trust that all is well. Yeah, I agree. You know, this is my sense of how the inner worlds work, that uh, one path seems to be open and everything's moving ahead. And then suddenly that path closes up and another one opens over here. And I mean, they're, they're very resilient and adaptable, often far more than we are. Yeah. And, and I agree, you know, the, there were gateways open through the commercialization that, that had not been as open before. In fact, there were ways in which uh, the New Age movement was becoming rather elitist. And... Um, and that got that got broken down, but um, but yeah, something gained, something lost. Yeah, well, let, let I have to tell you. Uh, yeah. look, here's my funny story. I I was contacted by uh, Newsweek magazine back in the day, and and an appointment was set up for one of their editors who was writing, who wanted to write about the new age to to interview me. So. <laughs> I get this phone call at 6 a.m. in the morning because she forgot there was a time difference between um, the West Coast and New York. <laughs> so I'm on the phone with her, and, and she's very sweet, and she says, so um, tell me about crystals. <laughs> and I said, well, I, I don't know anything about crystals. What? <laughs> she said, well, uh, you're, you're new age, aren't you? Oh, everyone new age is, has crystals. And I said, well, I don't. She said, oh, well, okay then. 
thank you, and hung up. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> That's awful. Listen, I'm going to move the conversation on. Because yeah. we're, we're moving into the last 10, 15 minutes of this conversation. Right. Yeah, goodbye, crystals. But goodbye, crystals. Um, so one of the areas that you and I have always been interested in, and this may shock some people, is we, we have an awareness of what's happening in the world politically. Yes. So one of the and this is to this this is not irrelevant people because this is to do if if we're part of a huge ecosystem where cosmic love is incarnating one of the ways it does this is through through governments through states through nations through international relations all those kinds of dynamics um and what one of the metaphysical esoteric stories is of the founding of the united states being a, a metaphysical intention that there was a deep and profound spiritual optimism in the founding of the United States <laughs> that would lead to a, a very holistic melting pot that would um, be a model for the world. And that the president in his her inauguration, in their inauguration, would be blessed in a certain way. And that with the assassination of Jack Kennedy, JFK, that blessing was shattered. And I have a sense, and I'm curious to see what you think of this, I, I have a sense that the, the darkest shadow of that shattering emerged in the woundedness and stupidity and wickedness of Trump, that his time is over, and that Biden, in all his, all the jokes people make about him being old, but he has a certain persistence and a certain um, no, nobility of intention as a politician, that I feel some hope about things shifting back into place in the United States. And I see a similar bubbling in the United Kingdom at the moment. But, but I'm a glass half full person, you know, so I'm always looking for a um, optimistic picture. What's your take on all that? Well, um, I feel that that, that spirit of, uh, of America, let's just call it, that uh, founding spirit, is only partly anchored through the presidency. An important part is, but but it it has other anchors as well uh, in the land, in the people. Um, yeah, there's no question that JFK's assassination um, was a real shock. It it definitely uh, it definitely created a wound. I think a much greater wound, actually, from my from my living through it. A more traumatic event was uh, when Bush Jr. took the presidency away from uh, Gore, uh, when the Supreme Court uh, cut off the counting of the voting in Florida, um, and and I felt that as a as a very deep wrenching. Um, and I remember feeling uh, this, this really was, was a kind of energetic coup. Something has, has stepped in here that shouldn't have been here. And, uh, and then we got Bush and we got um, Cheney and we got you know, the, the invasion of, of Iraq and all of that. And and I, the presidency has been wounded. I think Obama tried. The healing it tried to happen there, but he was as much a polarizing figure as, as not. I agree with you that Biden, my take on Biden is that he's, he's holding an energy. He's restoring. He is, in fact, restoring something. And 
And there's a very strong push against that. There's, you know, just as you say, there's this, a darker element has emerged out of the wounding that doesn't want healing to take place. But my sense of that is that the forces of that healing have, have spread out, actually. It's not, it, it's not concentrated just through the presidency um, that, or any, any other single institution as far as that goes. Because it, it either has to live in the, in the collective psyche or else it can't ground itself. It has no president going to make that much of a difference these days. Um, but I feel very optimistic. What I feel on the ground here is that, that, that dark cloud that came up through Trump, which I feel is actually necessary. I feel Trump was a necessary uh, event. Um, I remember at the time, uh, one of my subtle colleagues said, this was before the election, he said, um, neither person, neither Hillary Clinton nor Trump will be president, which I thought was an interesting thing to say. And then and went on to say that uh, Trump would be elected, but would never ha hold the energy of the presidency. Mm -hmm. That um, the spiritual force couldn't anchor itself with him, but that what he was doing was important and would bring things to the surface that had to be dealt with. What I feel is happening under Biden is that that's gradually being um, absorbed and healed, but it, but it may take a few more years before we see the end of it. I, I, but I have to say, I'm seeing the light at the end of that particular tunnel. Yeah, I'm optimistic as well. And do you have any feelings in general about China, Russia, the planet as a whole, Africa, Nigeria, South America, the way the whole thing is cooking? You know, I feel contrary to what the press says, I feel this is a very bad time for autocrats because the ground is shifting underneath them. Um, slowly and surely, there's a uh, change happening at, at a mass level. It may not take the form of the kind of liberal democracy that we had, you know, in the last century, but, but it, I'm pretty sure it's not going to be supportive of autocracies either. Something else is trying to emerge. And I think it's one reason why those people who are trying to hold on to their autocratic power, having, why they're clinging so hard and having a hard time. Um, you know, I, I guess at a surface level, it all seems very much in flux to me. It's hard for me to say, uh, this is how it's, these are the events that are going to take place. I'm, I can't foretell the future that way. But under the surface, I can definitely feel this rising of, of, an, of a, a new kind of expectation of how a human being should be and, and the kind of world we should live in. So, so I am optimistic. Of course, I'm paid to be optimistic too. I mean, that's my uh, contract with the inner worlds. <laughs> that's your that's your contract with the inner worlds. Yeah. <laughs> I, they, they cut off my they cut off my spending money if I start getting pessimistic. Really? Okay. <laughs> no more toys for David. No, no more like... light units for me. <laughs> okay. Well, I, 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 we're coming towards the end. I love the nature of this conversation because it's been deeply spiritual, deeply honest, and it's also moved from the personal into the spiritual into the 
political and and the the political and awareness of the world is is part of embodiment yeah you know incarnation yeah william i just feel that what's trying to emerge through humanity you simply cannot fit in the than the shoes that we're giving it in the institutions that we have. And that's religious and political and economic institutions. They are not expansive enough. They're not of the right quality to contain. And so the initial impact of all this is to shatter and to create disruption. But behind that, I feel there's a great deal of creativity. But we may have to go through a period of shattering to get to it yeah the rise of global education that that most children on the planet are literate now yes and the, there's the stimulation of intelligence intelligence us lot we're getting more intelligent we're getting more sussed more conscious yes and that allows us or stimulates us to be more careful and caring in the way that we open our hearts and be fully present. Um, it's a long journey, though, for humanity, isn't it? You put it's one step forward, a little bit pushing the boulder up the mountain. Yeah. Well, I mean, you have to consider how much inertia we're working against, but also the inertia we're working with because there is a tradition of love in humanity. Yes. So it's not like we're not like we're blackguards trying to become transformed. We're just trying to rediscover our deeper self and our, our potentials. And we will. Yeah. That I, I have no doubt about we will. Yeah, I, I, I just I, we, we could go off on a long conversation about rediscover because I think it's an emergent awakening to growing. Exactly. You know? it's an, and uh, listen, we're, we're coming to the end. Can you, everybody, um, we're coming to the end. So I'm going to ask David to give us a blessing that takes us into our concluding moments. Does it sound good? Give me a thumbs up and a wave, please. That sounds okay that we're cooked and it's the right time. There you go. Great. So, David, hey, all right. Blessings from all blessings. of us. It's blessing I love you. time. <laughs> give, 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 lead us into a blessing, oh, beautiful man, beautiful soul. I will. First, I would ask you to hold your own heart in your consciousness, in your awareness, and to bless yourself, to recognize your capacity to love, your capacity to be a blessing and to bring blessing into the world. So bless yourself. And then be aware of the room in which you're sitting, the specific, actual, physical location where you are. And recognize its capacity to be a chalice of love and blessing to receive your blessing and your gratefulness and to return it to you. A partnership of blessing with your own local environment. And then be aware of all the people listening right now to this discussion, tuned in to this Zoom room, and all the people who will listen to it in the future.
and recognize the blessing that we are together. Affirm and bless each other. Our presence in the world, the love that we bring, is multiplied many times over by the connections we have with each other. And finally, think of your life and activity in this world that you have come into this world, we have each come into this world as a gift from our souls, as a presence capable of bringing love and changing the environment of the world from fear to safety from hatred to love and bless your path, bless your incarnation, bless your life, bless the activity that you engage in each day. <clears throat> 